Philosophy for Our Times is brought to you in partnership with the New College of the Humanities, a university level college offering undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in the heart of London. NCH pride themselves on offering unprecedented access to a world class academic faculty. Philosophy students at the college are taught by some of the foremost scholars in the field, and one to one tutorials create a personalised teaching experience. Choose your major and minor for a unique combined honours degree and study the NCH Diploma to widen your appreciation of the world in ways you'd never thought of before. Go to nchlondon.ac.uk for more information. Think better. Think NCH. Hello and welcome to Philosophy for Our Times, the podcast which brings you the world's leading thinkers to debate today's biggest ideas. Today we are thinking about life, beauty and being. This week, our speakers take on life, beauty and being by going in search of an answer to what is beauty. So once beauty was about goodness and truth, but now we think it means little more than models, products and outdated art. Beauty is a central guiding principle in most societies. But from Monet to Kim Kardashian, can we really define what beauty is? Have practical concerns and the economy of desire made beauty trivial and expendable? Or could we follow Goethe and Kant and cultivate our aesthetic judgment to enrich our lives? Going in search of beauty to enrich our lives, this week we have ad director of the public sphere, Justin Clarter, founder of Coco de Mer, Sam Roddick, and philosopher and film critic, Bent Nane. As ever, we'd love to know what you thought of this week's episode, so do get in touch and let us know what you thought. Head over to iTunes to give us a rating or review. We love producing this podcast for you for free, and we'd love to continue to do so for as long as possible. So please do subscribe today to never miss an episode, and have a look at all of our podcasts and get downloading. Back now to Danielle Sands, who hosts this week's episode. So the question they will be responding to first is, is the goal of living beautifully a conceit of the privileged elite? And we'll start with you, Justine. Hey. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I very strongly believe that it is not. Um, I think that, first of all, we have to talk about definitions, how I think that popularly, when we talk about beauty now, um, people do associate it with models and fashion and uh, everything that I think contorts the true definition of beauty, which is uh, in the more, I see it in the more platonic sense as a kind of abstract form connected to the good and the true. And uh, something that is a kind of guiding principle of our life that we find in many different um, areas, be it in looking at a beautiful sunset or seeing a beautiful interaction between two people uh, or looking at a a piece of art that somehow elevates us as as human beings. And to me, that is not trivial at all. Um, And uh, and in fact, I think that's the the essence of morality is grounded in that kind of conception of beauty. The essence of being a human is grounded in that conception of beauty. And so I think oftentimes when when people associate beauty with um, with other things and they say it's it's not significant, it's not consequential, it's because they're thinking of it in this more modern sense where it is connected. But I'd like to completely separate the two because if we confuse them at all, we're talking about something entirely different. So um, from my perspective, my, my research is grounded in this idea of the beautiful soul. And this was kind of grounded in the enlightenment principles of you know, striving towards rationality, striving towards equality, striving towards kind of scientific truth, but it was also uh, kind of at the the bridge between enlightenment and romanticism. And then the play with the the emotions and the significance of feeling and experiences in the world and encounters with people. Uh, These these things were united in this concept. And essentially the idea of the beautiful soul, which we now would dismiss uh, in the age of Trump, I think to think about the beautiful soul sounds ridiculous, but I think you'll see more and more that something that I think a a very pragmatic approach to the world in politics and in in economics and society has kind of branded as insignificant. We will see with the total demise of values that this it, it re- again becomes very significant precisely because it holds a kind of more objective truth. And um, so in, in relation to this, I mean, I would just say that this concept, um, the basic idea was that you could kind of cultivate yourself almost like a person sculpting 
uh, a sculpture. You can sculpt away the impurities. I essentially, the idea was in your soul. You, we often think about physical health. We think how our you know, body operates, but we never think about the condition, or the state of our soul. And if everyone did that every day, I think it would have huge implications for how we treat other humans, how we interact in the world. Are we living a life of value and meaning? And so a lot of this was thinking about, okay, well, our individuals' actions in the world, a lot of it was thinking about the subjective, uh, you know, cultivating virtues, uh, cultivating a kind of sense of, of self in relation to others, but it was ultimately directed at the objective, a, a kind of collective good. Uh, so it was, while it was very subjective and individualistic, it was for the sake of humanity, because the idea was in line with a kind of Kantian idea that enlightenment is, you. you it, you know, the French Revolution, the chaos that happened in, you know, something that was so good, but then, but then eventually led to the terror, if there's kind of dogmatic action that's unreflective, it won't lead to any more clarity or truth. It will only lead to chaos and madness. And so the idea was kind of taking up that Kantian principle of we each are kind of a very significant per like being in the world that, ha that is a unit in a society, and that if we don't realize our um, potential, if we don't cultivate latent potential, then we are not being you know, active moral agents. And that's so essential to larger frameworks of morality. Uh, so I think, so I, I guess I'm out of time probably, but um, yeah, I think it's absolutely fundamental in that sense. Fantastic. Thanks, Justine. That's a really great start for us. Uh, ben, sir. Thanks. So the question is whether beauty is the privilege of the elite? Yes. So um, my guess is that very few people <laughs> would say that it is. Um, and I guess, you know, that would be a bold position. So I'm going to take that bold position. So I think that beauty, at least in some sense, in some sense of the terms, traditionally understood, is the privilege of the elite. And that's why we should not care about beauty in that sense. Maybe we should care about beauty in a different sense. So maybe it's a definitional question. So we're going to see that, I guess, later. Uh, but I, I do want to argue that much of what we care about in the world of art is not beauty anymore that may have been beauty in the 17th century um, with Lorraine's little uh, landscapes and stuff but not really anymore that's not why we go to uh, to exhibitions that's not why we go to the cinema that's not why we go to the theater or not why we go to concerts uh, what the reason why we do go to these events is to get experiences that are really rewarding for us special kind of experiences and some of those experiences are what has been traditionally described as beautiful, but not all of them are going to be that. So, um, so I think it, in some sense, it's been a big mistake for aesthetics, the philosophical discipline, to be obsessed with beauty. Because beauty is just one aspect of what we find interesting or, or exciting about, about art. And uh, it would be a good idea for, if you want to understand our engagement with artworks, to, to kind of widen our horizon and to, to focus on because disengage with this obsession with beauty and, and focus on various kinds of experiences of all, of all kinds. Um, that's my pitch. Thank you. Um, Sam? Well, I'm kind of interested in the concept of beauty and how I personally experience beauty, but then also the political interplay that it has within our lives. And then actually from an economic point of view, where the commodification of beauty comes in. So there are these three areas of beauty that I personally interact with. And I was really thinking about it because what does the experience of beauty really feel like? And when do you actually get to observe beauty and what state are you in? And I think that is a really interesting question. And I wanted to come up with an example where actually beauty Beauty shifts and changes with biorhythms, and that sometimes is from an emotional perspective, but then also through political kind of eras without within history, what is considered culturally beautiful also shifts. And you're seeing that kind of speed up as kind of aesthetic styles are kind of get dumped and put into the landfill and new ones arise and old ones get reborn. So the way I wanted to describe my emotional interplay with beauty was how I can see somebody who's asymmetrical and very typical, I can immediately find them an extraordinary example of physical beauty. And as I get to know them, various realities of their characteristics start to paint 
going to hue on their features that allows me either to redefine somebody who might be immediately not very attractive into somebody who is stunningly attractive that comes and their aesthetic shifts as you either emotionally bond or find them kind of repugnant. Somebody very beautiful can shift into a form of ugliness in front of your eyes. So when you actually have this, you can start to realize that your emotional landscape actually feeds your perception and that can be ever shifting all the time. And I think that's a really important perspective to hold Hold. And also, when do we see uh, a beautiful kind of uh, sunset as beautiful? We have to be in a state of observation because we can walk past beautiful experiences every day, like a symphony of birds, and all we're hearing is our thoughts or our stresses, and we actually kind of can blank out these kind of extraordinary kind of feelings of presentness, because actually observing beauty requires us to step out of ourselves and actually be an observable character. Now, the most important question is, have we changed or have we commodified beauty and made it of an economic value? Does somebody who is more beautiful hold a more value, social value, and therefore is more rewarded within our economic society if they hold the right features that we can recognize them with? And is somebody who is ugly penalized for that? But also, that also comes in with actually the history of what we culturally have defined as beautiful has always been dictated by the politics of the wealthy, from religion, from the, 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 the color blue that the Virgin Mary was painted. It was illegal for any artist to use it other than that. It was the most precious color. The actual um, uh, uh, geometrics of a temple was controlled and you were kind of kind of physically penalized by the church if you actually uh, uh, made a church to disproportions of the golden mean. And so I think that is also the fact that actually beauty is about exclusivity. There is, there is not necessarily in terms of a cultural perception. And of course, we have situations where artists die and suddenly their art is considered beautiful where it was valueless before. So there are all of these factors attached to it that we have to kind of realize from the emotional experience to the actual cultural dictation of what is socially acceptable as beauty and what that means to us as an individual and where does that incongruency lie between our experience and where culture and the wealthy are using it and politics and religion is using it therefore as a way to conf uh, conform, as a form of conformity. Thank you. My pitch. Is it over? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I wonder whether it might be good at this point to think about definitions of beauty. How do we go about defining it? Should we define it? And how, if you had to define it, how would you do it? Justine? Mm. Well, I would just, I mean, I think my, my sense of beauty is very much, as I already said, platonic, uh, and also uh, kind of 18th century, 19th century German philosophy really picks up on the platonic ideas. And one, con I mean, I'm not sure if this is, it isn't a definition, but I think it illuminates this, this debate a bit, is that this Schopenhauerian idea of like, the experience of the beautiful is one that if in a world where your will is perpetually striving for something, uh, you can suspend your will, uh, and in, in that moment you are com completely present in the experience of the work of art or the, the experience of nature. And that does something, I mean, be beyond Schopenhauer, that does something. When we, for, for example, are able to reflect on the intricacy of a leaf, you know, in all its beauty, w when we have that level of perception of the world, uh, and that extends to a much more transcendental understanding of beauty, I think we're better able to empathize with others. Uh, just a simple example of looking, for example, reading a book, you're completely immersed in the narrative um, of that person. And if that person has lived a very different life from you, you're suddenly able to empathize with them. In a similar way, two children, you know, when they're playing in the garden, they see a butterfly, they want to share that experience. It's one conducive to reciprocity, whereas w once you enter something material, it's the exact opposite effect. So um, I think that's why, again, I want to completely separate uh, a kind of, you know, culture. Uh, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with 
in, in this sense of the word, beauty is uh, exclusive, but that's very different than an inclusive, universal understanding of beauty, which you can find in, in nature and, and uh, very many other experiences. So maybe that, I don't know. To me, beauty is very much connected with empathy, understanding a, a kind of vivid perception of the world that illuminates everything and makes it poetic. And when you enter that state of being, you, you in turn are more receptive to experiences in the world. Uh, there's a creativity that comes into play. There's a kind of connection to, for example, fract fractal sy systems in nature, a, a kind of understanding. It's, it gives us a guide to more objective truths. Um, so, thank you. So can I, I can actually pick up on something from this. So, um, so what you're describing, kind of going back to Schopenhauer, is, is an experience that's clearly very important for some of us. Um, is this kind of detached experience of the world when we are somehow um, without being interested in what in the purpose of this object we are just contemplating its uh, formal properties in a detached way something like that and I and I think this is a really important experience um, in fact I wrote a book about it called aesthetics as philosophy of perception um, I think people who, who were much better at describing it than Schopenhauer were, for example, Proust. Proust was going on about exactly that kind of experience and sometimes was really very perceptive about, um, ab about it and, and other people like Camus, for example, and also uh, De Chirico. Um, uh, there's a lot of kind of cool quotes that you can, uh, you can look for this. But here is my problem. I think that this experience is both geographically and temporally very limited. So I think this is something that probably was not there before the 17th, 18th century. And it's on its way out. That is my thought. And it's also very, very geographically restricted to Europe. It's not something that you're going you're gonna to find outside Europe. So, I, I, th so I, I really I deeply care about this kind of experience because, you know, I was raised in Europe in that part of human history. But I think we should see that that's, uh, that's the thing that that's what it's all about is a bit, I don't know how to say it, colonialist, um, both uh, geographically and also temporally. But so are you saying then that, that Justine's claim that we can have an inclusive understanding of beauty is wrong? I just think, that no, no, I think that that's what we should do. So I think that on, on, a, on a very general level, we are in f complete agreement because I think that what we should try to achieve is some kind of really inclusive thing, uh, understanding of beauty that covers lots of other things other than this kind of Schopenhauer-esque Proustian uh, experience. But I think that, um, that there's reason to think that this kind of this, this disengaged, disinterested attention way of engaging with the world, in the age of smartphones, it's on its way out. Our kids, they're not going to know what it is. That, that or that if they do, our grandkids are not going to know what it is. They're going to have a completely different conception of what beauty is or what, what kind of experiences are worth having when you, go to, uh, when, you're, uh, when you have an aesthetic experience. So I think, uh, I don't know, I just want to warn that we should be aware of our, the limitations of this concept. Sam, maybe this is a good point for you to jump back in. Do we need a new notion of beauty? Well, I think there is a, there's a personal truth within that, and that, as I bring it back down to experience, like, so what I find fascinating when you talk about nature and you talk about structure and you talk about design, that actually, as human beings, we are of nature. And so I think that a lot of times that beauty can actually be distilled sometimes into mathematics as well, because there is like certain structures that beauty comes with. And there are part of it, there are different between like having something very asymmetrical that is um, a mirroring its own shape to being irregular. And it's this, f this fine line between the two. So that I do think sometimes beauty does come with a way that we want to kind of visually harmonize and understand and kind of categorize what we're viewing. But then within that, there is an element of our emotional experience which takes us to the age-old pre-probably philosophical kind of accounts of actually experiencing something other than just what is here. And it's almost like an experience. I'm, I'm not religious, but and like experiencing God in that kind of sense that is something so beyond us and so mysterious. So I think sometimes like um, beauty is attached to mystery of being uh, uh, of something of a shape that kind of takes you out of yourselves and gives you a gasp of breath. So I, it's not like that I feel we should redefine beauty, but I feel like we all need to familiarize ourselves with what do we truly 
individually relate as beautiful and see how it marries up to these repetitive structures that come up. And we talk about fractals, we talk about snowflakes, we talk about all of these uh, flowers and the formation of flowers and leaves. You can see them mirrored in everything we build today. And usually what actually we respond to on a biological level with all the scientific research around responding to beauty is we respond to somewhere in between something that is asymmetrical and irregular. But if it's too asymmetrical, we actually start to not see the object. So I think that is, for me, more important, familiarizing ourselves with our own emotional state, what makes us react and interact with beauty, and how do we individually define it. I think that's more honest. I think that might be an interesting time to, to think about the relationship between beauty and morality. I mean, you've mentioned this a couple of times already, Justine, that the ethics comes in very quickly yeah. um, when you're talking about beauty. I wonder whether you like to say a bit, a bit more about that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, first I would just like to, I, I think it's very common uh, in the West among an elite for people to say beauty is elitist, but actually when you talk to people from other countries who are not elite, beauty is one of the first things they say keeps them going, it gives them a sense of purpose in the world. And so somehow I think we have this, I, I just fundamentally disagree with the idea that beauty is somehow something of the 18th and 19th century reserved. I mean, beauty is everywhere. That's the whole point. It's universal. And to say that, I find, is quite elitist because it's almost presupposing that other people don't have the capacity to feel and experience beauty, which to me completely contradicts the whole point. So I think so many societies have been founded on principles of beauty. They've used dance, they've used song, they've used you know, weaving techniques, whatever. That is all aesthetic. That is all a consideration of beauty, and that was, is what holds communities together. It's, and so this, in turn, I think ties in a bit with this uh, understanding of morality. To me, beauty is uh, a point of connection. As I was saying with the kind of sunset or you know, some, a very simpl simplistic experience like that, um, you know, somehow we don't call, you know, for example, you know, now in music people are talking about money and wealth and like just, and that somehow is not elitist. But then to ex experience something that is universal, like a sunset, is. And I just, I find that very problematic. Um, and so I would say that beauty, the reason I think it's so, so kind of closely tied to morality is the fact that it's connected to this universality. It's a striving for the universal. And while we can all find things that are subjectively beautiful, it's the idea is that we're united by something common and that it's, it's a communal undertaking. We're sharing something that is beyond ourselves. Uh, it's almost like a secular kind of religion. This is a unifying experience and that we're able again I think here's where perception comes in again but I think just the ability if we deaden our senses to the world then how can we actually understand or empathize with others I think so much of our uh, deadened morality our, our deadened sensory perception is is because we haven't experienced beauty we're so closed off to beauty that it's very easy to forget everything else so in in that sense I think it's kind of Beyond the just objective, I, I believe personally, I think this is more of a um, based on faith than on uh, empirical evidence. But I believe in these kind of forms that are in inextricably bound, bound. And I agree that uh, with what Sam said about like a beautiful face becomes ugly or classically beautiful. It's not, you know, it's an embodied. It's it's something that's embodied, but actually the the essence of it is the thing is the personality. It's the spirit. So that is what the the truly beautiful thing, and that I think is where the beauty and truth come into full full play, and and also goodness. But even if you don't take the form as the subjective form that you hold true, I think just in terms of looking at examples of of human societies and how they work, beauty is something that connects. Sal, what do you think? Are, are beautiful things always good? Uh, no. Well, I I I. I'm not going to answer that question, but I will. Um, uh, well, no, I don't think so. It depends on what you define. Like this, you know, you can have a p one can perceive um, a snake as either beautiful or ugly. So that I'm not. S what I'm really interested in is the economics, historical economic structure, and how it has been used to alienate. That's what I'm interested, and I think that's a reality. I don't think that needs to continue to be a reality, and there are an aspiration, and I agree with the aspiration, but the reality is 
um, even in tribal societies, there are certain headdresses and certain kind of materials that become unattainable, and there are certain things that people can't eat. There are certain restrictions that actually create a sense of hierarchy, and that has been going on for a very, very, very long time. And I think that is an interesting kind of reality that we need to deconstruct because it is unhealthy for the masses. For instance, we've gone fat, we've gone thin in terms, and now we're going fat again in terms of our aesthetic of what is sexually kind of uh, perceived as um, an aspiration. Like in the 50s, for instance, the, the, the adverts were all about fattening up post-war. Like ha there were adverts in the very same way of all of these diets uh, 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 that you can buy today or health and well-being being kind of a, an overarching uh, uh, kind of industry that pushes you to feel neurotic about actually who you are, how you see yourself in the mirror, and what kind of unrealistic expectations you should be having. But the truth is, the majority of obese people in our country are poor, right? And that is seen as a kind of... Um, almost a sin, right, in an old-fashioned sense. You have failed if you're obese, but yet thin, too thin, is also kind of an addictive state of kind of neuroses, and that is actually kind of um, congratulated within our society with extra thin models. We're starting to reconstruct this with Kim Kardashian's bum, but like, you know, that again is a form of com modification, and this isn't new. This is very, very old within the history of of our kind of civil society. So yeah, I think it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Benson, do you agree with Sam? Do you think that we always need to think about uh, the ways in which aesthetics is politicized? I think aesthetics is always politicized, and that's part of the reason why I'm skeptical of, the, of this way of thinking of beauty in this uh, 18th century manner. Um, because the politicizing at that time is very different from the politicizing now. But let me just say something about the uh, well, who's elitist and who's not. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so I, I guess my point is that everyone has aesthetic experiences. That's a really important part of who we are, and that's uh, that's something we should really care about. Our aesthetic experiences. I'm just going to use aesthetic experience and not the concept beauty because I find aesthetic experience less confusing. Maybe I'm idiosyncratic. Uh, but the kind of aesthetic experience that Proust goes on about, and that's really important for me personally, uh, we should not generalize that, either to people who lived earlier, or to people who are going to live later, or to people who live in different parts of the world. This is one kind of aesthetic experience that you can have. So there's many other kinds of aesthetic experiences. Experiences that we find really important and valuable. We pay, you know, big buck to get them at the thea in the theater or in the, in the exhibition. But if you're it's finding aesthetic experience a, a more useful term than beauty, perhaps you could define aesthetic experience for us. Well, uh, I mean, again, aesthetic experience has this kind of broader sense and a narrower sense. And the broader sense is just experiences that we deeply care about and we go out of our way to have them. And there's something, and there's I, I, can, I, I can kind of restrict it a little more, but I think it's good to keep it very broad because we have no assurances that people in different parts of the world or people who lived earlier, they're going to have very s they have any kind of similar aesthetic experiences that we do. So in the medieval times, people were not going, th they were not having detached experiences of the, uh, of the Madonna. That's not, that's not, that's not the game. That was that not what they were, they were supposed to do. And but then there's the kind of the more uh, narrowly construed aesthetic experience that I think that, uh, that, that you're after and, and Schopenhauer and Proust and all these people are after. And there's a way of trying to understand it in terms of, uh, the way I'm trying to understand this in terms of attention, that the idea is that your attention is not focused on certain features, but it's distributed, uh, it's it's, it's and it's detached, it's some kind of detached distributed attention that characterizes that experience. Um, yeah, I, th I think I've talked enough. But just, just one final question. Um, we started about talking, mora talking about morality. Yeah. I mean, would you say that aesthetic experience is, is a good thing? It's connected with the good in some way? It's a good thing. It's clearly a good thing. It's a, it's a very good thing to have. <laughs> Life would be really boring <laughs> and, and irritating without it. Whether it's, uh, whether there's, I'm very skeptical about this whole, you know, Pla Plato, you know, Plato idea of, of the beautiful, the good and the true, and they are all kind of coming together. Mm -hmm. 
that sounds a little, uh, you know, that would be nice, but I, I just don't think that that's, uh, that's really the way it is. So yeah. I do have an example where aesthetic has had a direct effect on the social well-being of a community. So I work a lot with various different um, organizations and NGOs and charities, and one of my favorite no longer exists, and it's called Land Life. And it's a wildflower organization. And wildflowers, they only grow in kind of the worst soil possible. So um, if you have like a kind of a pummeled up concrete kind of earth, like from an uh, like um, from a demolition and plant poppies there, they're going to thrive, right? So they go in there, or they collect wildflowers, but they go into kind of disenfranchised communities. Um, and they were working in a community in Liverpool in an estate that had a high crime rate. And then they went there and they kind of shook up all of like the concrete kind of like desert land. And they planted Everton blue cornflowers, huge amount of acreage in this estate. And they did this over a number of years. And they found that through this, the ascetic beauty of just inundating with these beautiful wildflowers throughout the whole of spring and summer had such a huge effect on the community that it cut down crime, it helped people to start to interact, it just had this overarching kind of sense of beauty and value, but bringing that kind of emotion that you're talking about, which is intangible and actually non-commodifiable. Um, and I think that, that really, uh, that was really moving and quite, they did a lot of social studies on it. So I th that's an example of where actually aesthetic can hold a benevolence and in that kind of sense um, can aid society into bettering itself with the right energetic and the right kind of intention. I think often it's the case, like that's a really beautiful example and exactly the type of spirit that I'm getting at. Um, I couldn't agree with, I mean, that's just such a lovely example. And I think there's so many of them. I think part of the confusion and problem is that oftentimes when something isn't in the world, we tend to deconstruct it. So there are no more ideals anymore, or you know we have a you know pre political leaders who hold no you know dignity. So suddenly the world is that, but it doesn't have to be that. It's very easy to negate these things and to contort their meaning because we are frustrated with the fact that it isn't true. And I think one of the things that's so powerful about beauty is that, of course, we all know that Kim Kardashian is not, not beautiful, to me at least. I mean, I don't know her personally, so I, <laughs> I can't like, just the fact that we have to bring up this, like, to me, morally hideous person into the conversation <laughs> is precisely the problem, that that has to come into the, the picture, and sadly it does, because that's the way that we see it, to me, is the grave insult to our society. And so, I, I mean, I think that my, my point is, yes, the world is like, that is the conception now, but does it have to be that way? No, and do we have to deconstruct a sense of beauty because that's the way the world is? Absolutely not. We can re kind of elevate our ideals of what these things are and hold ourselves accountable just as we would uh, with a, a moral system of, a, of any s sort. And I think once we, we think in that way, it, it's quite liberating because suddenly examples like Sam gave, they're so powerful, become apparent. And, and we realize there's actually a, a lot more accord. Everyone agrees with that. I mean, I, I can't imagine anyone who would say that that's not a good thing and it didn't do something, uh, you know, valuable for a community. So, so once we think in that way, it's, it's actually very fruitful. On to our final theme, which <laughs> is the question of where we go in the future. Um, so should we be cultivating beauty or is it something that we should be abolishing? Spencer. Beauty in what sense? The idea of beauty. I think, I think we can't really live without let's just call it aesthetic experiences. We can't really get out of bed in the morning unless we're looking forward to some kind of valuable experiences that we're going to have that day. Do they have to be beauty? Like the I, I'm not sure. But again, that may, that may be just a definitional thing, really, the whole disagreement maybe just about, about what, what's the, what's the, uh, how we define beauty. Um, but yeah, so, we, so, so I think it's immensely important to have these kind of special experiences that you really deeply care about. So in that sense, I think beauty is something that we clearly should not uh, should not throw out of our life, and that's uh, just that also we couldn't. Life would be ver life would be very difficult to live without it. Now the you know the kind of contemplation of the I don't know, uh, Lorraine landscape 
you can do without that, right? There's other ways of getting this kind of uh, aesthetic experience than the kind of the traditional things that we consider beautiful, that's all I'm saying. So you're saying that if beauty is a name for some kind of enriching aesthetic experience, then fine, we can keep it. Yeah. If it's this more specific thing of, of the detached um, experience, then maybe not. Yeah, I mean, may maybe, maybe for you, the kind of aesthetic experience that gets you out of bed in the morning is not that you're going to go to the Louvre and you're going to look at the Vermeer for ha three hours. You know, that's some people like that. I like that. Uh, but some uh, some other people don't like it. Maybe maybe what gets you out of bed is that you're going to rewatch a Seinfeld episode or something. That's aesthetic experience, all right. Um, and just about, yeah, maybe I shouldn't go. Okay, I'm just going <laughs> to leave it like. <laughs> Went to say something about King Kardashian, but I'm not going <laughs> to. If you like Kim Kardashian, go for get your kick out of that. Don't, there's no reason to dismiss that just because you think that uh, that's a morally repugnant person. First of all, how'd you know? I mean, you know, she's married to Kanye West, so that's a reason. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's, um, if, if that's what's going to give you your daily dose of beauty or your daily dose of aesthetic experience, you should not feel ashamed about this. This is what, this is what you're going to, this is, this is important that you have that. It's not looking at Vermeer for three hours, but if you look at Kim Kardashian's butt, and that's where you're, you're I, you know, your important experience, then I, yeah, that's I also something. I still fundamentally disagree with Good. that. I mean, finally I a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> I like that there's controversy. It makes it more exciting. Um, but no, I would say I completely agree with you. I mean, of course, not everyone should look at Vermeer's, and you know, you can get aesthetic pleasure from many different things. That's why I bring up simply a leaf. Like I think so often we uh, kind of forgets that there are, there is so much beauty everywhere. I mean, look at the place where we are. Like, look at the, the hills and the verdant landscapes. And I mean, there's so much universal beauty. It's almost impossible if you were actually aware of it all to process it because it's an overwhelming miracle. And um, s I think part of it is that if you haven't had a kind of an experience of beauty in this sense, where you're so overwhelmed by the beauty of the world that you're kind of completely transported, it's very hard to describe. If it's just a pleasing, oh, it's nice, you know, looking at this painting, that's not the beauty I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that is entirely different than a pleasing e aesthetic experience. Although I would say the definition of aesthetics is beauty. It's pleasing because it, it is beautiful uh, in the kind of traditional sense of the term. So I, I do think they're connected. But I, I, I would say that we have to have some sort of value system here. And I'm sorry, but Kim Kardashian's bottom is not that. And I think it's so pathetic that we have come to say, okay, well, but we might as well bring this into the but definition But who are we to beauty? judge? Hang on a second, hang on a second. But I do think I'm going to interrupt in the sense that I think you're both talking about slightly separate things. You're talking about things that are for free, right? And you're talking about something that is about cultural manufact manufacturing, which is interesting. And I agree, a butt is a butt. Like, I'm interested in the biorhythm of thin butt to fat butt to thin butt to fat butt. Like, in the sense of where we are in our political history and actually how that gets dictated to us as something being shown as aspirational. And I think th the Louvre is equal in that, in the sense that there has been so much much agenda around the institution of art that we can't take it out of that perspective, right? Because there has been a hierarchy. Now, I love art, right? I absolutely love art. But the makers of art can't afford their own art. And that is historically fact. Even today, they could not afford to buy their own art. Even the wealthiest of, maybe Dam Damien Hirst can, but he's an anomaly. Right, Michelangelo couldn't, and neither could even D Leonardo da Vinci. So you have to understand that the makers, these amazing makers who make the most incredible embroideries, who stitch and who, who are stonemasons, who are the people who fabricate this brilliance, they can't afford it. They could not afford to buy the temple. They can't afford to buy the palaces. They are made for other people. So yes, I'm in wonder. But I also am also understanding that we are being funneled through these social perspectives and they're very different from commodity to free. And that is very interesting interplay to have because actually through the history of time, we have been worshipping the moon as a wonder, 
right? So that goes back into the roots of our own religious spiritual thinking and our own language. So I don't think we can see something as simply ascetic because it has all of this historical kind of psychological, symbolic kind of, um, uh, 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 it's, it's programmed into our DNA to be able to respond to it. So I think that is interesting. So yes, I think beauty is a part of existence and sometimes beautiful is ugly. But I would just like <laughs> to say that I think sometimes there's a conflation of the structures around beauty and beauty itself. It's true, like in the modern arts uh, industry, it's a terrible, unbeautiful thing if you're that, for example, you know, people can't necessarily afford paintings, like art has been, you know, a sphere for the elite, but that says nothing about the art itself, unless it perhaps was created in a, like that was the intention of the art, was to be created in this kind of elitist way, or, or I mean, it, it, it was around a kind of commodified, kind of that was the idea of the art itself. But the thing, I think, must be separated from the, the structures which bind it and the way that it's made accessible. And I think once we can separate them, then we can you know, address the issue of ac accessibility or the, the economy or whatever other issue. But to conflate them, I think, is a problem. Can we make that separation? I think it's problematic. I mean, when you look at the church, there's one of the original forms of art that existed was religious art. That was there to, as hieroglyphics, to kind of point the poor to the right direction of thinking. So the snake had a symbol, the apple had a symbol, and they all it was a it was a visual language. So it's very hard to kind of separate the two. And that's where I bring it back to your point, which is let's make it about us as an individual and really help ourselves define what is true to ourselves in order that we can steer our own ship to actually have our values reflected in what we perceive as beautiful. And I think once you do that, it's coming from quite an emotive place. And it, somehow I kind of trust emotions a little bit more, but I am so love the aesthetics. I love structure. And I do think the simplicity of structure can sometimes be divine just for being what it is. So kind of in betweeny. <laughs> I think what we should be a little we should be a little less prescriptive when it comes to beauty and when it comes to aesthetics. Get your kicks when you find them. I think that's I'm a great place to end. Get your kicks <laughs> when you find them. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Philosophy for Our Times. The podcast was brought to you by the Institute of Art and Ideas. It was hosted by me, Anna Carey. And our guests this week were Justin Clarter, Sam Roddick and Ben Stane. Please do subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. Head over to iTunes and give us that rating or review. And of course, tune in next week for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.